Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. Um, there you can find links to our Twitters, our blogs, and all the back catalog of over 100 episodes on scientific computing. I've, I've again here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. So we are recording here just about on the eve of the eclipse. I, I think this episode will probably be published after that. So everybody will have seen super exciting totalities, including me and including our guest today. Yeah, in an, in an office full of tech people, you can only guess that you know around half of our office is taking that day off to go do something related to the Eclipse. So Yeah, it's actually it's an stereotype. excused absence it, at my kid's school. So we just oh. have to say we're going to the Eclipse, and that's good enough. That's, that's actually not a bad idea. It's like the one time to be able to see it. And now where you are, it's much closer to where you are than where I am up here in Michigan. Yeah. We, we just drive two hours south, and it's right here in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So we're just going to drive down on the highway, pull off on some country road style, and like picnic style spread out and bask in the glory of the totality. So we have with us the CTO from PBS Works at Altair. Uh, you want to go ahead and give us an introduction? Hi, this is Bill Nitzberg. Uh, really happy to be here with you guys. Um, I got my start actually back at NASA where we uh, developed the PBS Pro software. Uh, now I'm the CTO for uh, PBS Works at Altair. So uh, can you give us a quick rundown of what is PBS Pro? Sure. PBS Pro is a software. You know, it's funny. I always um, end up at these conferences where I can't tell whether someone's selling software, hardware, or services. So I always start with that. Um, it's software, it's middleware, so it's operating system little, level middleware um, that does job scheduling and workload management. Um, if you're an HPC, I don't have to say any more. If you're not an HPC, you probably should say a little more. Do you want to be well, an HPC on. today? Yeah, you, well, you said one little phrase there. Let me ask you, you said it's operating system level middleware. What do you mean by that phrase? Um, so I, I sort of think of software as, as three layers. So there's, well, so there's the hardware. You know, you, people know what that is. You go buy it. Um, there's the operating system. Everybody knows what those are, hopefully. Uh, and then there's applications that you use, like Gmail or, you know, like some uh, computational fluid dynamics application that's, that's blowing air over airplane wings. And then in between all of that stuff, in between the applications and the operating system is this stuff called middleware. Um, and it does, you know, the extra stuff that the operating system doesn't do. Okay, so then what is PBS Pro's relation to that? You said it's, it's middleware. Let's pretend we're not an HPC today so that we give our, our non-HPC friends a little overview here. Okay, awesome. So um, PBS Pro uh, is software that you use on large HPC systems, so clusters or clouds where you're connecting together lots of different um, nodes together, lots of different computers together. Um, and the simple version is that it sort of does... Um, traffic control, um, scheduling. So what happens in high-performance computing is a lot of the work is super computationally intensive, so it uses a lot of compute power, um, and it, tends, it, it ends up being cut up into little pieces and handed off into the system in what I would call jobs. Um, and then there's also a lot of people, say, competing for that resource. And so there's a lot of jobs from a lot of people. Uh, and PBS Pro does the traffic control, the scheduling, um, the the watching of the system to make sure it's still running. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But clarify something. This doesn't serve a role in terms of like your programming API, right? This is managing the resources, but not serving a role like MPI or CoArray or something like that, right? Uh, that's right. So we take pre, effectively prepackaged. Um, what a job is to us is sort of a prepackaged thing that you might run on your own from the command line. So you might run, say, um, some structural optimization code. Say you ran Opdestruct to you know test the the flexibility of your cell phone display or something, um, and you could run that from the command line. You'd say blah 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 Opdestruct blah blah blah, uh, and it would uh, virtually crash test your cell phone into some cement. Um, but it might take three or four hours. Um, so, and you might not want to just drop it once virtually, you might want to drop it from a lot of different angles and a lot of different heights. And so that ends up being say a thousand different jobs that you might want to run. Um, and so instead of running those thousand different jobs by hand, one at a time, what you would do is you would package them up into jobs, um, and you would submit them to PBS. So PBS, it's not the API layer. It's, it's really at the, 
uh, application layer. And it's, it's very agnostic to application. So I, I just used Opdistract as an example, but it's, it's anything that you could run basically on an HPC system. Okay, now PBS in itself has a, a long history, and you even referred to it uh, in the beginning back there. Um, give us a little bit about the history and the evolution of where this came from. Ah, well, um, actually, there was a system back in the very early super mainframe computer days, uh, in the sort of the Cray days, called NQS. Uh, I think it stood for Network Queuing System. Um, and the group, actually the group at NASA Ames, even before my time, um, created NQS. Um, and as parallel computers were sort of looking, looming on the horizon, um, the folks who were developing NQS, I believe, ran out of space in some internal data structure and realized it was time to actually start from scratch. Um, so this was back in 90, 1991, I think. Uh, and they actually started a, a POSIX um, standards uh, effort to standardize what batch computing looked like. Um, and out of that came a POSIX batch standard for batch computing, but also came a reference implementation, which became PBS. And then became commercial PBS, and now is open source PBS. OK, so uh, scheduling seems relatively straightforward. I have resources. I lay stuff out. That's a very naive look at it. What makes scheduling difficult? That's a great question. You know. Um, I think if you're just looking at your own problem, so if you're, say, one organization um, and, and you just have one set of, of users who are competing for one machine, scheduling actually isn't that hard. Um, and a lot of people actually uh, continuous, continue to sort of build their own scheduling system or even just do something um, simple and, and you know, yell over the partitions and say, hey, it's my turn. Do you mind if I run some big job? Um, what makes it hard is once you go from sort of a group of people who can yell over partitions to, you know, people who are all coming in remotely, or you go from, say, a few hundred jobs a week to a few thousand, or you go from a few tens of machines to a few hundred thousand machines, um, just the combinatorial explosion makes it hard. And then HPC uh, is full of really strange and unique things like, um, you know, uh, nodes without disks or uh, nodes with Xeon Phi or GPGPUs um, or uh, networks that have a topology that you might want to map something to because you get better performance if you have a better mapping. Um, and all of that plays into scheduling. Okay, so that was a good history. But uh, what about uh, Torque? Wasn't Torque one of the open source derivatives of this somewhere along the line as well? Uh, yes, it was. Actually, I mean, here's the, here's the whole, the, the, the family tree was, uh, first it started out as the portable batch system, uh, which got abbreviated PBS. Um, in 2000, um, actually, I and, and the group of original developers left NASA to, um, to form a, a commercial company around PBS. And we um, coined PBS Pro at that point, and also Open PBS. Um, a few years later, a fork of Open PBS um, became Torque. Um, I think Torque is still alive. People are, I'm, I'm actually still bumping into it, so Torque is still alive. Um, Open PBS kind of died. Um, we kept going with PBS Pro. Uh, our group was acquired by Altair in 2003. Um, and then just last year at International Supercomputing, um, we dual licensed PBS Pro so that now PBS Pro is, is an, there's an open source version and then there's a commercial version. Oh, and what are the differences uh, between the two? Ah, um, our goal is actually to try to eliminate um, as much as possible the technical differences between PBS Pro and PBS Pro. In fact, we, we decided to choose the same name instead of resurrecting the open PBS name um, because um, our strategy is um, to try to kind of bring the two worlds together that have formed around some, some using open source uh, workload management job schedulers and some using commercial uh, workload management job schedulers. And we really wanted to try to bring those two worlds together. Um, the, I mean, the, obviously, we, we have a commercial version, and so the, the, how, we, how we differentiate on them is that the commercial version kind of like, I guess the way to think about it is um, more along the lines of, say, um, the way Red Hat does, say, Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? So you, you get all, all the features exist in both, um, although actually you get tons more features in Fedora. You just get tons more bugs. And if you want something, you know, if you want something stable and supported and that you get regular updates, you go with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that, that's sort of the philosophy we're trying to trying to do. 
That makes sense. So how has scheduling changed over the years? Because that's not how HPC started. Um, you know, we, we, well, there were many different form factors of HPC, but um, a typical one that most people think of is, you know, small clusters of Linux machines. Back in those days, it was Pentiums and the like and whatnot. But now we have entirely different form factors like you talked about with GPGPUs and Xeon Phis and their thousands and thousands of cores and remote users. What is your perspective and how has the software had to evolve to handle these kinds of scenarios? So, I mean, so scheduling has gotten, well, actually, I think scheduling has gotten more interesting um, of late um, in the in my early days, which is too many years ago to talk about, um, scheduling was pretty easy. There were CPUs and memory, and that's about it. And and you just had to do some some counting. You just had to say how many CPUs are allocated. Okay, don't allocate anymore. Um, then we actually got parallel machines, which made things interesting. Um, in fact, we got some weird parallel machines. Right? We got this CM c connection machine and the Intel Paragon and, and IPSC 860 and stuff. Um, and it became kind of you know all over the place. Um, then it went to sort of these white box Linux clusters where everything kind of looks looked the same for a while. Um, a little bit harder than just CPUs and memory because now you had nodes and nodes had CPUs and memory. So that made it a little harder. And, and, but today, boy, it's, it's fun. <laughs> there's GPUs, there's Xeon Phi's, uh, there's FPGAs, um, there's multiple different kinds of network architecture. Um, and actually one of the more interesting things um, that we're doing is, is scheduling uh, not just based on sort of matching and, and use of things uh, like licenses that you buy once and you use for a year, but power where, you know, if you turn it on, it uses power and that costs money. And when you turn it off, it stops using power. It doesn't cost money. Uh, you guys doing anything with ephemeral resources? This I'm specifically thinking cloud. Um, ways that you can burst or run dedicated? What, what are you guys doing in that space? Um, we are. Actually, it, it's a really nice um, uh, 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 analysis. Hmm. It's very close. Scheduling for cloud is really close to scheduling for power, which is really neat, right? So when you turn on a cloud resource, it costs you money. When you turn it off, it, it saves you. It, you, know, you don't pay money. Uh, if you bought a machine, when you turn it off, it saves you money. When you turn it on, it costs you money. Um, so the, the scheduling problem is really um, very, very similar, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, so we're having a lot of, we're doing a lot of stuff with cloud. I mean, you can also, a cloud, you can build a cluster in the cloud. And, and so PBS Pro works really well for, for managing resources in the cloud if you want to share them. Um, a lot of people just want to use them for one job and then turn it, turn it off. Uh, if you want to just use it for one job and turn it off, then we have a lot of folks who are doing what's called sort of hybrid um, cloud, hybrid computing or cloud bursting, where maybe you have a cluster um, inside your organization and for peak demand or for, you know, particular kinds of applications, uh, you, you send them to some cloud where it's either cheaper or faster to get the results. Uh, and for that, you know, PBS Pro can automatically connect to say Azure or AWS, um, create a small cluster for the job, run the job, tear it down, send the results back. And that's that's what cloud bursting is. Is uh, PBS Pro also handling things like data staging and other things? Because normally your shared file system, Scratch, uh, you know, reference genome set stuff like that don't also span across the WAN or slow across the WAN. Does it handle that kind of logic? So it can. I mean, here's this is an interesting um, issue problem. Uh, in HPC, I think in general, and in hybrid computing. So uh, the quick answer is yes. Of course, PBS ha you know can move data around. That's not that's not an issue. You can say, hey, before you start my job, please stage this data in, or please stage this data out um, when you're done with the job. Um, the big problem is actually a lot of these applications have a lot of data, and and it doesn't make sense to stage it in. Or certainly, well, staging it in is usually free for some clouds, but staging it out can be actually pretty expensive. Um, and so. Um, People who are designing their cloud strategies, I don't think it's a solved problem yet. They're sort of trying to decide what they want to do. So if you have a huge genome database and you want to do cloud computing, you're better off storing it, you know, you're using Amazon or something, you're better off storing it in Amazon than you are trying to access it or copy it in and out. Now, I want to jump back to something that you mentioned uh, earlier. You said that, um, you know, you have the open source version and the closed source version. What drove you to, what, were, what was the rationale behind that decision? Um, because you see a lot of impassioned arguments on both sides of this coin of the open source or the proprietary and things like that. And you have explicitly and deliberately made a choice 
to well, not fork because you're trying to reduce the technology differences between the two, but you've made the choice to be on on both sides. Uh, why why did you do that? Well, um, it was actually a hard decision. Actually, if you if you uh, got a view into the internals of, of of Altair, you could see that we had a lot of a lot of long discussions over it. But um, in the end, here's here's what we here's how we view things, which is that, that, so in my tenure in HPC, I don't know, I'm curious what you guys think about this, but there's always been, especially in workload management, these two worlds, the the public sector, um, universities and research, and the private sector, like, you know, Fortune 500 companies, and the public sector loves open source, and the private sector, it's not like they hate open source, but they actually just want to get their, they just want tools that work with support and stuff, and so they gravitate towards commercial software. Um, and at least in workload management, that meant um, that nothing could reach critical mass, or nothing has, I don't know if it could, maybe that's the wrong way to say it, nothing has reached critical mass, right? I mean, look at the open source um, progression of, of tools in workload management. Uh, so NQS was actually open source back in the 70s. Okay, that was before open source even had a name. Um, but that was, re that, that um, you know, as that fizzled out, PBS actually became pretty well known, then Torque became pretty well known, then Grid Engine actually took over, uh, Condor for a while, um, and now Slurm is the big thing in the open source side, but I'm not, I, I don't, I don't feel like anything's ever been able to take hold and stay. And, and my view in, on that is because nothing's been able to bridge the gap over into the commercial side and then reach critical mass. So our, our idea anyway, I hope it works, uh, is that if we can have a dual licensed tool that plays really well in the open source world, in the public sector world, and also plays really well in the private sector commercial world, uh, maybe we can bridge that gap and reach critical mass. And how's that been going? Because I would tend to generally agree with your assessment of open source versus just give me a tool that works um, for the different audiences and things like that. Are you seeing good adoption on both sides of that? Um, yeah, uh, we've had, a. I mean, we've, we've had a long time. We've spent a long time in the commercial world, so we have really good commercial set of customers, a couple thousand commercial customers all over the world doing all sorts of neat stuff. Um, and in the last uh, year, and, you know, it's, it's really hard to count um, open source um, users, as, as you probably know, with OpenMPI. You sort of have to do statistical analysis or see how many people show up at a BOF. Um, but I do know how many people are sort of contributing on the open source pages and stuff. And we have about a hundred um, sort of active contributors right now. And okay, look, uh, to be fair, you know, 30, 40 of those are from Altair still, uh, maybe even 50, I don't know. Um, so actually it's hard to count who's from Altair because everybody's using their GitHub ID, not their Altair ID. Um, so it's, it's actually going very well um, so far. Well, you, you actually anticipated my next question was, what exactly is your definition of open source? Are you just throwing code over the wall or are you actually building a community? And it sounds like you're trying to at least build a community and you are having success in having people actually contribute new code, right? Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the goal is, is to create uh, one, one PBS that everybody likes, um, one PBS Pro, I should say, that everybody likes. And, and the only way to do that is to be sort of very aggressively open on the open source side um, and then, you know, very nice and supportive on the commercial side. And so we're trying to do both. Um, and so we're, whenever we're making, in fact, some of the decisions that we've made, um, we've made to try to make the open source um, to, um, more open. So inside Altair, we actually, as part of the whole effort, we reorganized ourselves to act as a contributor. So if you if you go to the if you go to pbspro.org, which is where everybody should go, you can look at the show notes. I'm sure for that, um, you'll see, and, and you wander around on the various open source sites, uh, you'll see that we're acting as one contributor, and we're following all the rules that are posted, and and you know people are even even people internally are complaining to other people internally, saying I'm not sure you can do that because the community might not like that. So it's actually kind of nice. So support models, I mean, you, you covered a lot of that, but here's an interesting question. Because it's now open source, it also has the ability for a person who wants a support contract to also modify it locally and not contribute it back. Uh, have you ran into that situation? And if so, how do you handle supporting something that's been modified, non-configuration of actual source code modification by the, uh, by the person who wants to buy support? 
Yeah, no, that's a, it's, a, it's something we struggle with a little bit. I, I will say that we've been really lucky. Um, even with our closed source um, version for many years, we actually had a lot of um, source code customers. Um, for example, NASA Ames is a source code customer. Um, and they wanted a lot of support, and, and we supported them, but they modified the heck out of the code. Uh, I would say that right now we haven't run into that problem, and we've been really lucky of the people who've been modifying things that they're um, pretty intelligent, smart folks. And you know, maybe PBS Pro only attracts really smart people, and and you should, if you're really smart, you should use PBS Pro. <laughs> that's totally what it is. That's that's <laughs> yes. Make sure all the listeners know that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Really, it's totally it's spun with gold thread. <laughs> well, let me ask you this then. So if you are just a contributor, does that mean that there is some third-party organization that holds the code? Or are you just treating yourself? Like, what, what is the license that this code is under, including the stuff that you get from contributors? Okay, so the the we're using it's dual licensed, so it's a, a regular commercial license that you expect from commercial licensing. Um, it's available in that, and then the open source stuff that you download on GitHub is under uh, a GPL um, version three license. Um, it's not held. So right now, Altair still holds all of the the intellectual property. Um, obviously, though, it's a GPL, so you can get a copy. Um, we did that um, because we really want the dual license to work. We really want to be able to take um, the innovations that happen in the open source community and move them over to the commercial side and, and vice versa, move from commercial to open source. Um, we also did that because it's really new for us and we're learning and, and we didn't want to, you know, take some path that we couldn't undo um, in terms of like, you know, if we went into, say, the Apache Foundation and we decided, oh, no, the Linux Foundation is where we should have gone. Ah, <laughs> So we wanted to sort of dip our toe in. Um, before we before we dive in, and what kind of response have you gotten from the community? You said you've got uh, upwards of fifty external contributors or so. Um, what what kind of things are they submitting? Are they submitting just oh here's a little bug fix where you have a typo, or are they submitting like genuine new features, or how's that going? Um, a little bit of each. I mean, actually, we we released it at International Supercomputing um, not this year but last year, so a little over a year ago. And within three days, somebody submitted uh, a port to, I think it was Debian, because um, it didn't compile in Debian. So they, they submitted a pull request for that. We're like, wow, cool. Okay. <laughs> that was fast. Um, but we've also gotten uh, a, a handful of bug fixes, um, a couple of new features that actually make it a little easier to configure PBS. Um, we actually got a huge dump of Kerberos code, um, but then that was withdrawn because the person who contributed actually moved from one organization to another, and I don't think they had the support to, to finish the process, which was a little disappointing. Um, but we're hoping, we're hoping that the original um, organization you know, hires someone new and then they come back. But that was like 30,000 lines of code. It was crazy. We were a little worried about that because we're like, we have to, okay, the, right now the, the, you know, we're, we're trying to structure this like a real open source project. So there's a set of maintainers. Right now they're all Altair. Hopefully one day we can expand that. Um, and they review all the code um, before it actually gets, before the pull requests are get accepted. And we're like, 30,000 lines? Uh-oh, <laughs> someone's going to have to review that. So since you've gone open source, is there somebody who is like a household name that picked up the open source version? Um, wasn't a customer before using the commercial PBS Works version, like somebody knew who somebody would know? I wish I could give you a better answer to that. Um, the, the biggest contributor outside of Altair right now is uh, uh, Cessnet, C-E-S-N-E-T, in, in Chechia. Um, the, the people using it, we, we, I did see someone come by, or one of the guys um, at ISC this year saw uh, Quantum, the the big manufacturing company, come by and take pictures of our booth, and they asked them, "Hey, w what are you doing?" And they said, "Oh, well, we use PBS. We use the open source version of PBS Pro." I'm like, okay, I don't know how you find out that people are doing that, but <laughs> but that's cool. So, um, I, you know, I, I think I think we're we're spending all of our time on technology and a little less of our time on on marketing the open source. And I think um, I'm really glad that you guys set this opportunity up for for us because I, I think. Um, people still don't know about about the fact that PBS Pro is available open source in some sense. Because I, I do bump in about, I would say about now half the people I bump into say, oh, it's open source now, really? Okay, open source or not, uh, what's the, and you don't have to name any names because I know there's a lot of companies that are 
you know, protective of how much resources they devote towards high-performance computing. But what's the largest system, let's go by core count, um, managed by PBS Pro? Uh, well, that's easy. The, the biggest system is still NASA Ames Pleiades, uh, the one you saw in the Martian, if you got that little tiny bit that they, they scrolled by. I thought that was great. Um, the movie, that is. Uh, they have... Uh, you know, they keep changing their machine because it's a, it's a whole bunch of, well, now it's HPE hardware, uh, and they keep rolling in new hardware. So um, when I looked a couple years ago, there was 12,000 nodes, and um, they were scheduling 250,000 cores, some of which were virtual, a, as one system. Um, I think they're actually down to, to like 10,000 nodes, but up to more cores because they replaced some of the old stuff with higher core count new stuff. So... In the 10,000 node range, 250,000 plus cores, which is pretty big. Okay, and then what's the strangest use you've ever seen? Um, we, we've had a lot of people on here, something they never expected to happen. What, what, what have you seen someone try to do? Uh, you know, I, I, you, you guys um, nicely sent me some, some of these questions beforehand, and, and th this is the one, that, what is the strangest use of PBS Pro that I, I, I've been racking my brain about, um, because most of the folks are using PBS to do scheduling, and it's not too strange. I have seen a lot of strange uses of features of PBS. Like, we'll design um, a feature of PBS to do one thing, and somebody else will, will use it to do something else. Um, I was at a weather site where we we had expected, for example, them to use advanced reservations to schedule their weather models, right? You know, the weather models run, let's like, say, four times a day every six hours. And so we have this advanced reservation feature where you can set aside some resources to run that model, and you're sure they'll be there. Um, they didn't like the reservations the way we designed them, so they were using them in this really weird way where they were making reservations that were like 24 hours out, <laughs> And um, then the way the scheduler behaved is it would make sure that that reservation was available later, uh, and that created a hole in their system for backfilling that they used for something completely different. <laughs> so, so people use features all, all over the way that we never expect. Um, but I don't know that the whole software suite has been used in a, in a surprising way, or at least not yet. So let me riff off of that and, and uh, go off something you said earlier in the conversation that scheduling has gotten a whole lot more interesting recently with new architectures and uh, new topologies and all kinds of things like this. Um, what is your most interesting feature or, or your, your favorite feature from that perspective that is just needed for the new and growing, evolving, complex HPC scenarios? Um, I'm actually really uh, excited about some of the stuff that we're doing in power, I think, um, in part because I think it's really early days in, in power management um, in, in terms of sort of limiting power, running for power. I mean, if you look at, so one of our um, bigger systems in Japan was the Subame 2.5 system, um, which was all, you know, big green system uh, run by Tokyo Institute of Technology. Um, and they had this real big problem, which was, uh, they were only allotted 0.8 megawatts for their system. And so they had to run it, you know, with a power cap. And so it didn't, it didn't matter you know, how many CPUs are using, how much memory do you need, you know, how, what is this? They also had this extra, um, almost orthogonal issue that they had to manage at the same time. And so I think what's making, I mean, what's making scheduling interesting and, and what, what's, what's cool inside of PBS now is, okay, now how do you take, how do you take these different things that you're trying to do? So you're trying to maximize utilization. You're trying to, you know, get turnaround time as, as, as uh, short as possible, um, you know, maximize throughput. But now you also have to minimize power use while still, you know, making people happy on those other dimensions. And so there's just there's so many dimensions now to play with um, that it's, it's become a really interesting problem and a really interesting system. So how do you play with that, though? Do you just power machines down or do you power cores down or do you change C states? I mean, what, what kind of things can you do? Um, all of that. But um, we try to stay out of we try to stay out of exactly what we do. And we try to separate out sort of some the policies of what people want to do from the mechanisms of how they do them. So, uh, you know, PBS is really good at counting. So, for example, if you want to keep under a threshold, so I'm under some power cap. Um, you can allocate power and then, you know, jobs can ask for a certain amount of, of well, okay, it wouldn't be, uh, yeah, it would be power. Sorry, I, I keep getting mixed up with power and energy. 
I'll let I'll, I'll let the listeners look those two up if they're not sure what they mean. But uh, even I get mixed up, and I've been in this world for a long time. So, <laughs> but to to cap power, you know, jobs can ask for a certain amount of power, and then um, we're good at counting, so we can make sure we won't go over that power limit. Um, but if you also want to say run some low priority job at a lower power, you know, we have facilities to do that. Um, how you set that lower power, whether it's a C state or frequency or or what you're doing. That's sort of a mechanism, and, and we let you plug in, you know, whatever you want to plug in to, to pick the right mechanism for you. Um, we also have a, a facility for looking for when nodes become idle. So if, if your cluster isn't 100% used all the time, you know, maybe you have, you know, Sunday nights it's not used or something, well, we can go automatically go out and find nodes that are, are going to be idle for a while and shut them down. Um, or just put them into a low power state. Again, that, the mechanism of how, how it reserves power is kind of up to you. Um, some of it is what we're doing. Some of it is what we're rolling out. I mean, one of the, so we're, I think I would say we're still in the process of moving a lot of stuff that only exists in the commercial code over into the open source, um, project. Um, and a lot of this stuff is in the commercial code because we did it, um, in concert with, for example, SGI when they existed as a separate company, um, or Cray. And so now we're, we're in the process of rolling that out and, and figuring out how to make it general and, and acceptable to a wider community and, and putting it in the open source project. So, Bill, besides these power things, uh, what other uh, new features are coming in the future for PBS Pro? Um, we're doing a lot sort of in the, the, the exascale space, <laughs> um, meaning um, connecting to other things in the ecosystem. Um, um, but also scalability, a lot of scalability stuff. So we have uh, sort of, um, I don't want to call it a prototype because it's running in production, but we have some uh, really great throughput code that takes PBS, current version of PBS, up to 10,000 jobs a minute throughput, end-to-end -end throughput. Um, and we're going to roll that into uh, the open source project and then into the commercial um, generally available code. Uh, we have uh, a... Uh, another feature we did only that is only exists right now on Cray systems that lets you run schedulers, uh, multiple schedulers in parallel. So you take one PBS system, so it still has one database, and sort of when you do a status, you get one status of everything. Um, but you can cut the system up and run multiple schedulers with different policies for different parts of the system. Um, that, and that also is, both speeds things up and then also gives you a little more flexibility about how you set scheduling policies. So. Exascalies. So those are the exascaly stuff that aren't power. So I already talked about some of the power stuff. Um, in the other part of our, our world, we also have some, some non-open source stuff. I don't know how much about the rest of PBS I should talk about, but with PBS Works, we've focused a lot on the user experience. Um, and we're just about to roll out, I think, in the next couple of weeks uh, in uh, a beta version of, of the next version of PBS Works, um, which will be generally available in, in the coming months. Um, which is really tuned um, toward, I, listen, with a real focus on the user experience. So a real focus on, you know, for engineers um, being able to just do what engineers want to do without paying any attention to HPC behind the scenes. Um, or a real focus for system administrators to sort of just, just get their job done, like just get a snapshot. Hey, is things working? Things are working great. I can go away. Or, oh, something's not working. Let me click on that red thing and see what's not working and fix it. So along the same lines, um, there has been a bunch of resumed discussion over the past, I'd say, even two years or so um, about uh, MPI integration with job scheduling systems. And it seems to have gotten deeper and broader uh, over the past couple of years. Is, is this something that the PBS Pro community is working on, looking into, talking about any of these kinds of things? Um, definitely talking about, um, we actually started working on some fast job launch stuff. Um, by, by working on, I don't mean writing code yet, but sort of doing design work and, and figuring out what we want to do um, with the uh, PMIX community. Um, I mean, the idea is uh, better. Uh, I mean, the idea, well, with, with MPI is, so PBS picks a bunch of nodes to run your job on. Say it picks 1,000 nodes. Um, it knows what they are. Um, and, then it, and then it hands control over to your job. If your job happens to be running MPI, the first thing MPI does is it goes, well, what thousand nodes would I give it? And let me find out about them. And, and that takes a little bit of time. And so the kind of integrations that we're trying to do now, and this is where PMIX comes in, is, is eliminating that dual uh, 
find out about the universe um, and just letting PBS pass down to MPI, hey, here's what the universe that you're given looks like. Um, you don't need to find out again. So maybe you could take a little less time on startup. So, so that's some things. There's actually other, other things in MPI and, and we've only talked to people and, and we, on the commercial side anyway, we, we get driven by uh, what people want to do you know, next and, and not so much why what people might want to do 10 years from now. I'm hoping actually that on the open source side, we get some more of the researchy stuff coming in um, from that. Um, but we don't, the, the, the discussions we've had about um, you know, growing and shrinking jobs um, in fact, we have some code that we put in that we're actually, I didn't talk about that we're also putting into PBS to shrink, shrink jobs, um, but also, uh, you know, handling resilience. So, you know, your 10,000 way MPI job loses, loses 10 nodes. Uh, you don't want to kill the whole thing and start over. It's been running for a week. You know, how do you handle that? So we're, we're dabbling with that, but I don't think we've, we're, we're not, we're not to the point where we're writing code or there's an obvious solution. Okay, Bill, uh, where can people find more about PBS Pro and PBS Works? Um, so PBS, the, the place you should remember for PBS Pro, uh, the open source project, is pbspro.org. Uh, and that has pointers to all the other sites, because um, there are a few other sites like the community um, bulletin board and the, the contributors portal and, and the issue tracking system, which are all over, all over the web and GitHub. So pbspro.org. Uh, for PBS Works, um, you should go to pbsworks.com. Okay, well, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thanks, Bill. Uh, thank you. And just, you know, please uh, go take a look. Go sign up for the announcement list at PBS Pro. 